I want to talk to you today about the altar. Everybody say the altar. Now the definition of an altar is it is a sacred place, a place of prayer, a place of worship, a place of consecration, and it is a place of communion with Almighty God. And in the Old Testament, we especially see the word altar referenced many times. And in the Old Testament, the altar was usually a high place. Everybody say high place. high place. And throughout the Old Testament, we would see that there was two types of altars. There was the holy altar that God's people, the priests, would put together. And the sacrifices were made there. The, the, uh, the blood was, was shed on that altar as an atonement for man's sin. And, and burnt offerings took place. It was a very holy, a very sacred place of worship and honor unto God. But we also see that the pagans and the false religions such as Baal had their altars as well. And every time that a, an unholy, an unrighteous king such as Ahab and Jezebel, just to use them for, as an example, would reign, they would allow the false religions and the false pagan gods to build their altars. And they would usually put them up in the mountains, in the high places. That's what they would do. So then when a righteous king would come along, the first thing that they would do is they would command the prophets to go out and find the altars and they would send their army out to destroy those pagan altars and de desecrate them and decimate them and bring them low. Well, what does that have to do with us today, Pastor? What does that have to do with us in the year 2018? I want you to understand this morning that everyone has altars in their life, every one of us. And whether we know it or not, every single solitary one of us has an altar in our life. Altars are sacred places, lofty places, and we place whatever is valuable on it and hold it in high esteem. Whether it's either it's an altar unto God, will we hold Him in high esteem, our faith, our worship, our biblical principles, or it is an altar built up to something or someone else. Amen. It could be an altar that we have built up. If it's not built up to God, we build it up to our careers. We build it up to our money. We build it up to our status in life. We build it up to our possessions, our things. Maybe even we've made an idol out of our families. Maybe we've made an idol out of, out of ourselves. Whatever it is you worship, whatever it is you hold dearly and sacred, those sacred cows, so to speak, in our life, are our altars. And either they are an altar unto God or they are an altar unto someone else or something else. And in order to have our life in proper order, we must first, hear me, in order to have our life in proper order, we must first have our altar to God in its place. If the altar in our life is in its proper place, everything else will fall into place. But if, our, if, if we do not have the altar unto God in His proper place, our life will be a living misery and it will never satisfy us the way that it is intended to satisfy, that God wants us to, to be satisfied. Because after all, His Word says He came that we may have what? Life and that more abundantly. And if we seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, all these things will be added unto us as well. Amen. So I want you to understand that this morning, that if the altar is in its proper place, in, in, our, in our life, everything else will fall into place. Amen. We must always keep our altars pure and never defy it with anything unholy. Mm -mm, that's right. Again, let's start off. Altars are high places. Everybody say high places. High places. And altars are those places in our minds. I'm going to show that to you. Everybody has an altar in here. It might not be made out of concrete. It might not be made out of blocks. You might not have a physical altar in your life. But whatever it is that you're holding in your heart, in your mind, that is sacred and, and, un, and, and is, is consecrated is an altar. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 10. God gives Jeremiah his marching orders. And he tells Jeremiah this. He says, see... I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out, everybody say root out, yeah. and to pull down, and to destroy, and to throw down. That doesn't mean fight. I know in the south that we're going to throw down, that means fight, right? No. He says to throw down, and to build, and to plant. Okay? So he tells Jeremiah, here is your assignment. Here's what I've called you to do. Now he raised Jeremiah up as a prophet in the nation of Israel at a time when the pagans were with witchcraft and paganism was very prevalent in the nation of Israel. Like he did most every time that happened, he would raise up a prophet. Every time that happened, he would raise up a prophet. So he tells Jeremiah, your assignment is to do this. Is to root out and to pull down and destroy. Amen. And to throw down. 
But then after you've done that, I want you to build. Build what? Build the foundation and build correctly. How many of you know if you want to renovate a house, if you want to renovate a building, sometimes the only thing that you can do is to demolish the thing and start all over, especially if the foundation is wrong. If the foundation is okay, you just repair it and you build upon that foundation that was labored over. But if the foundation is bad and everything is out of order, the best thing that you can do is tear the thing down, desecrate it, and start all over. This is what God was speaking to Jeremiah, which his assignment was to do. I want you to understand this morning that that's what good Bible teaching does. Good Bible preachers will do this. Pastors have to do this. We have to many times tear down that which you have made as a stronghold in your mind. That which, I say you, us, that's what has been made a stronghold in our minds. The things we believe the falsely about God, falsely about ourselves. The lies of the devil that we have had perpetrated on, on us for many years. Maybe it was false religions you were raised up in and have come out. Maybe it was false beliefs. Whatever your idols are, whatever your altars are, whatever your high places in life are, when we first get saved, the first thing we need to do is bring, is desecrate those things and bring them low and wipe it all out so that God can build his altar we can build the art the correct altar unto God on the right proper things that's what I love about the Word of God the Word of God does that if you study the Word of God and it's taught right and it's preached right you will begin to realize that that which you believe doesn't line up to God's Word it needs to be brought low and I need to take what is God's Word and and place it in my life and build my life upon that let me give you another example 2nd Corinthians chapter 10 verse 5 says these words casting down imaginations Cast them down. Just like in Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 10. He had to root up and cast down. Casting down imaginations. What does that mean? Imaginations. That's in your mind. Your imaginations. And every high thing. Everybody say high thing. High thing. Where were the altars built? In the high places. So we are to cast down all vain imaginations and high things that exalt itself against the knowledge of God and bring those thoughts into captivity. Every thought to the obedience of Christ. Amen. That's how you do that. You've got to take every thought, every idea that you have, every feeling, every thought, every idea, every ambition, and you line it up to the Word of God. And if it does not line up to the Word of God, our responsibility is to be like one of the prophets. Imagine yourself like one of the prophets in the Old Testament and take a sledgehammer to that thought, that idea, that stranglehold in your mind. It might be a stranglehold that you believe from those who raised you, your teachers, society, the devil himself that says, I'm not worthy of God. I'm not worthy of anything. Nothing I ever do will, will, will mean anything or amount to anything and uh, you know just let people abuse you and run all over you maybe that's the thought I'm using it as an example maybe that's the imagination the high thought that needs to be taken and brought low or it could be on the other end of the spectrum maybe you were the, all, all that in a bag of chips in the world maybe you're watching this and you are all that in a bag of chips in the world you think you are well if, if you're going to receive the kingdom of God you have to come as childlike faith you have to come and you have to repent you have to bring down your high attitude you have to bring down down your high, sophisticated, falutin ways. You've got to layer. You've got to take your dignity and all that self adoration and self love, and you've got to bring it down to the altar. Either way, whether whatever side of the spectrum you're on, and most people are somewhere in the middle. If we're going to have the right altar in our life, we have got to sometimes destroy what's already there, and that's not fun. Let me give you a practical example of this from my life. I've been saved for 24 years. And when I first got saved, follow me with this because you identify yourselves with this. When I first got saved, I remember I had some altars that were built, some things, even I was only 20 years old, but some strongholds in my mind, some strong things I cherished, some things I coveted, some things that were idols to me, some things that were sacred cows to me. Amen? One of them was my partying, my friends. Uh, that's right. The other one was, was my education. I was able to get a, an education and then first one in my family to be able to do that because of circumstances of my father's death and, and, and the income we have. I was able to get an education. And, I, and I, I wasn't a very good student. It was hard for me, but I knew that education was my ticket somewhere. I believe that. 
And I wasn't seeking God or seeking His purpose for my life. The other thing was my music. I liked certain types of music that were not glorifying to God. And all that they did is infiltrate my mind and my soul and my system and cause me to want to live like a little fornicating, dope smoking, beer drinking heathen. And I knew that had to go. Those thoughts, those images, what I wanted for my life. There was altars that I had built up and they all had to go. Another sacred cow that was on that altar of mine was my politics. I was indoctrinated in universities. I was raised up in a very blue-collar home, and we were taught to believe that a certain political party was the only one that would protect us working-class people. And you know what? And if we voted any other way, we're going to vote that way because we're going to stick it to the man. We were going to stick it to the very wealthy, the very powerful, who had their, heel, their foot on our backs and kept us down in society. And we were happy to do it and vote that way. Here you go, boss man, in your eye when I cast my vote. That's how we lived. That's how we operated. That's what we believed. I was up in them, you know, the Rust Belt states. That's where I was raised. So that was a stronghold in my life. Stronghold in my life. That was the toughest stronghold in my life. That was the toughest stronghold at 20 years old to bring down for some reason. And I don't know why. I wasn't going into politics. I didn't really want to go into that arena. But for some reason, I remember my brother, I, I was talking to him about it at that time when I was realizing that I couldn't vote a certain way anymore because the way we voted was a part of a party. And I'm not trying to get political, but it was a part of a party that condoned murder of babies. Amen. And I said, I cannot do this as a Christian. But what about the other things? And I remember talking to my brother, and he's like, man, you're 20 years old. Why don't you just focus on finishing school? What difference does it make? You know, they're all liars. All they do is divide us to conquer us. And make division. Don't, don't worry about it. But for some reason, it was a stronghold to me. Because I guess I was a news junkie and a political junkie, even at 20 years old. And it was a stronghold in my mind. And that was the toughest thing. Forget the booze. Forget the partying people. Forget, you know, my ambitions when I answered the call to God because he showed me something that was even greater for my life. That was hard, but it wasn't as hard as that sacred cow that was on my altar. That was hard. And I finally had to do it. I finally had to do it. And I said, you know what? It's a shame that they brought us into this political arena in 1973. You know, we've got more jobs now than we've got people to fulfill them. Amen. Well, if I may tell you why, it's because people, there's... Billions of people, millions of people my age or younger, my age or older, or younger, who are dead in abortuaries that could be filling those jobs paying for your social security. Just saying. Amen. But it was a stronghold in my life. And I said, I cannot do it. I cannot do it. And God was convicting me of it. So let all my kingdoms fall. I surrendered to it. And that was tough. It was tough. It was tough. And I said, if I could ever find one of those other party people that, will, that, that is pro-life, I'll vote for them. Twenty-some years, I have not found one other than one city councilman in my city. It didn't really matter, city council, you know. But on the national level, state level, couldn't find one. Can't find one with a, with a search warrant. Can't find one with an FBI warrant. Now, I'm not trying to get political on you, but I'm trying to show you. I'm trying to drive a point home. What is your sacred cow? that's tied to that altar of yours that needs to be brought low, that needs to be desecrated, that needs to be brought down. You know, so there's a lot of people that are not in here in a spirit-filled church even though they know the Holy Ghost is right. Even though they know these are the things of the Holy Spirit is, is in the Bible. They can touch themselves, but they can't come and associate with them Holy Ghost people. Because what will Mama think? What will Uncle Chip think who is a preacher? Huh? You know what? That's a sacred cow. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Mm -mm -mm. Look at your neighbor saying, mm -mm -mm. So our altars are those high places in our life that need to be dealt with. Those things that, and hopefully we need to bring, the reason we bring those things low is because we want to exalt Jesus high. Lift Him high. Lift Jesus higher. Lift Jesus higher. Lift Him up 
for the world to see. He said, if I be lifted high, I will draw all men unto thee. Come on, put your hands together. Lift Jesus higher. Lift Jesus higher. Oh, don't clap. You're supposed to sing with me. <laughs> lift him up for the world to see. You know, that's who we lift up. Let my kingdoms fall and his kingdom rise. Amen. Let my high things, my yeah. pride, my ego, my, my desires, my ambitions, let them fall to the earth and desecrate and dissipate like dust. Hallelujah. Amen. Dust in the wind. Yes. And let he, yes. God, and his agenda and his purpose and his will be lifted high no matter what it costs me. Hallelujah. But that hurts, Pastor. Thank you, That's what an altar is, a place that I lay on. To die. It hurts. Mm -hmm. But after you die and resurrect, it don't hurt no more. Because you're new. Yes. Ha -ha. You got a new perspective. You got a new thought. You got the mind of Christ. It don't hurt no more. It only hurts, amen, until you're dead. Ooh, that's a good word, isn't it? I have a preach that some Sunday. It only hurts till you're dead. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. That tooth that the doctor rails on when you're having a root canal and it's painful. You know, I ever had it so painful. I've had that thing so painful. I'm a sugar junkie, amen? So even at 15, I have to have a root canal. My dad said, your head ain't worth 500 bucks, let alone, you know, that's good. You know, for this root canal. It was upset. Quit eating all the sweets, boy. So anyways, I'm in that doctor's chair, and I was in pain. You know, I'm a 15-year-old boy waking up in the middle of the night with pain, and Ambisol only goes so far, praise the Lord. So I find daddy's little whiskey bottle, you know, in the middle of the night. Whew, that didn't even cut it. So guess what? You know, at 15 years old, right? I needed Jesus. But anyways, here's the thing. So that dentist is killing that root, and he's killing it. And I'm thinking, get it. Get it, Doc. Get it. Yeah, get it. Get it. Get it. I hate it. I'm rooting for the doctor who's killing my roots, right? That's what happens when we die, when we lay ourselves down on the altar. That's what it means. See, an altar, let me remind you again, an altar is a sacred place of consecration, a place of prayer, a place of communion, a place of worship, a place with God. It is a place where we die to ourselves. So that Christ may live inside of us. Now it's interesting here in Ezra chapter 3 verses 1 through 6. Let's go there. I want to read you a story about Ezra. This is when the Jews came back. When King Cyrus took king, kingship. He wasn't a Jew. But he was a friend of the Jews. God put favor for the Jews upon his heart. And he said y'all come back now. You all go back to your home. You Jews go back to your home. You, we can rebuild. You can even rebuild your temple and even put it in the doc, his decree that we're going to even fund it. We're going to foot the bill because where were they going to get money? So they go back to Israel and they're trying to rebuild their lives for the first time coming out of slavery. And this is what happens. When the seventh month came and the children of Israel were in the towns, the people gathered as one man to Jerusalem. Then arose Jeshua, the son of Jezodak, with his fellow priests. And Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtai, with, with his kinsmen. And they built the altar of God. Look at that. They built the altar of God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it. As it is written, the law of Moses, the man of God. Verse 3. They set the altar in its place. Everybody say, set the altar in its place. Set the altar in its place. For fear was on them because of the people of the lands. And they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord. Burnt offerings morning and evening. So verse 3, they set the altar in its place. Did I not tell you that if we're going to have a victorious, successful life with God, we've got to get the old altar out of there and put God's altar in its place. Proper place. Amen. Not in my life like my colored TV. Not in my life like my favorite automobile. Not in my life like my pets and all that. Not in my life like my children and grandchildren. But in the center of my life. In its place. It has a place. Verse 4. And they kept the feast of booths as it was written and offered the daily burnt offerings by number according to the rule as each day required. This was how they worshiped in the Old Testament. We worship now with the fruit of our lips. Sacrifice of praise. That's our offering. That's our worship. But this is how they worshiped back then before Jesus. Verse 5. And after that, the regular burnt offerings, the offerings as the, at the new moon, and all the appointed feasts of the Lord, and the offerings of everyone who made a free will offering to the Lord. Verse 6. From the first day of the seventh month, it was around late September, or early October, by our calendar, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord. Here, watch this. Watch this. 
But the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. So before they laid the foundation, before they worried about the walls, before they worried about the roof, before they did anything, the ceilings, the interior, before anything else was built in regards to that temple, they first built the altar. Folks, there's a lesson in that. If you're trying to build your life, rebuild your life. Your business, your ministry, whatever it is. Your marriage. Newlyweds. Your marriage. Rebuild your marriage. The first thing you need to do is you need to rebuild the altar. Put the altar down. That is your place of prayer. That is your place of worship. That is your place of sacrifice. That is your place of consecration. The holy place. The relationship you have with God. Front and center. And everything else will fall in line. If you believe that this morning, come on and put your hands together and magnify the living God. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. You know what? It is true. It's a cliche, but it is true. I'm not seeing it in the scriptures other than a, a vague way, you know, in a vague understanding, but the family that stays together, the family that prays together stays together. Amen. I believe that, folks. The family that prays together stays together. Ladies, gentlemen, if you're single, you're watching this, and you're, you're believing God for a mate, don't pick one that won't pray with you. Ladies, don't pick one that won't pray for you. I'm not looking at you, Nim. I'm looking at the, the, the camera. <laughs> because you know what? I tell married couples, when, when I do premarital counseling, especially young ones, I say, don't, certainly don't do other things together that are reserved for married couples, but don't pray together until, you, you act, until the wedding day. And they look at me like, what? A preacher going to tell me not to pray together? Yeah. Because you know what? Prayer is a stronger bond than anything else. Yes. That's right. And if you will pray with your enemies, and I say that because a lot of marriages have become two people in the same house who are enemies. If you will pray, who you pray with, you will form a bond with. There's something spiritual that takes place. There's something that connects us, mind, body, and soul. Spirit, body, and, and, uh, and soul. There's something that will connect people that pray together. Amen? If you will pray for your, for your leadership in your church, you will be connected with them. If you will pray with them, you'll even more be connected with them. Amen? If you will pray with your children, there will be a bond there that they will never forget. If you will have a time of consecration where we say, this is the hour that we're going to study the Word together. This is the moment we're going to come together every day, put it on our calendar, circle it, and we're going to have a time of devotion. Daddy's going to lead, amen? Mama's going to help. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to then all begin to pray for each other and, and our, the needs that we have. If you will do that, your, your home, your marriage will do a complete turnaround. Trust me in this. Trust me in this. Why? Because you are honoring God and you are putting the family altar in its place. Huh? Somebody say amen. 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 Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 through 10, backs up everything I'm trying to share with you this morning. Here's what it says. Honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits of all your increase. That means your funds, your giving. Honor the Lord with your giving. Then, verse 10, so shall your barns be filled with plenty and your presses shall burst out with new wine. I'm here to tell you as a man who served Jesus Christ for 24 years, if you will be about your father's business first, he will be about your business. Amen. Amen. Put the altar in its proper place. Honor God the way God deserves to be honored. Lift him high and bring everything low. And I promise you this, you will see the salvation of the Lord. You will see the blessing of God in your life, in your circumstances. And finally, in closing, I've got one more for you. Malachi chapter 1, verses 6 through 11. Always, always, always make sure that you keep that altar pure. What does an unpure altar look like? An un I almost said, where's my cell phone? There it is, I can't use it. <laughs> an un unpure altar is this. Let's say this is my cell phone. Lord, I love you. I praise you today. You know, I'm here with you in this quiet place. I'm here in this place today, God, and you know what? Uh, your word says, your word says. Oh, I got three likes on that. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Worship. Oh, hold on. I, I, I'm busy right now, but I see what I'm putting you first. But I'll be there. I'll be there. Yeah, okay, okay. Hmm. <laughs> well, the caps won last night. Hmm. 
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Isn't that what we do? Or we come into the house of God on Sunday morning. If we do come into the house of God and just, you know, just not into it. Amen? Just not into it. Here's what God says about all that, okay? Because when your altar in your life is a place where you need to give God your best. Give God your best, your undivided attention. Amen. This is from the Message Bible. You can read it in the King James. You can read it in the English Standard Version. I like the Message Bible because it brings it out in modern day English and kind of amplifies a little bit. But, but the, I've studied the other translation. They say the same thing. But this is cool. Listen to this. Isn't it true that a son honors his father and, worker, and a worker his master? So if I'm your father, where's the honor, God says? If I'm your master, where's the respect? God of the angel armies is calling you on the carpet. You priests despise me. You say, not so. How do we despise you? By your shoddy, sloppy, defiling worship. Yeah. Woo. Yeah. By your shoddy, sloppy, defiling worship. You ask, what do you mean defiling? What's defiling about it? This is God calling this people to a place of repentance. <laughs> Verse 7. When you say the altar of God is not important anymore, worship of God is no longer a priority, that's defiling. Folks, do you realize that there are churches, and I've been in church growth workshops and seminars, that have actually from their mouth said your churches will be bigger if you don't open up the altar. If you don't, if you just have, if you take worship and don't make it worship, make it more of a song service. And don't give people the opportunity to feel the Holy Spirit. Some of you sat in those places with me and you heard some... And, and, and all these, these things, these manifestations, stop that, stop that. People are weirded out by that. Get, your, get, in, get them in, get them out. And if you do have to do that Holy Ghost stuff, if you have to do that heartfelt worship stuff, do it on a Sunday night or a Wednesday night. That's what they're teaching. This is what God says about that. Mercy. The altar of God is not important anymore. Preacher... Worship of God is no longer a priority. That's defiling. Can I say something this, this morning? I am so proud and pleased to be a part of a spirit-filled church led by spirit-filled worshipers who, who, and surrounded by spirit-filled, heartfelt worshipers who say the most important thing on Sunday morning is my ability to get together with other people, believe the same way I do, lift up holy hands and go after God and give Him the praise and worship He deserves. I would rather be in a church this size and have that than in a church ten times, a hundred times its size and not have that. Amen. I just wouldn't go. Yeah. Amen. And when you offer worthless animals for sacrifice and worship, animals that you are trying to get rid of, in other words, you bring your leftovers to me, blind and sick and crippled animals, isn't that defiling? Yeah. Try a trick like that with your banker or your senator. You go, God. Woo. I'm just reading what God said. Try a trick like that with your boss. Give your boss in your workplace the energy you give the house of God and the energy you give me, God says. Try a trick like that with your banker or senator. How far do you think it'll get you? God of the angel armies ask you. Get on your knees and pray that I will be gracious to you. You priest. Now notice he's talking to the priests, the leaders, the people who are supposed to be the worship, the leaders of this. You priests have gotten everyone in trouble with this kind of conduct. Do you think I'll pay attention to you? And if God don't pay attention to us, how are we going to get our prayers answered? God of the angel armies, ask you. Why doesn't one of you just shut the temple doors and lock them? Then none of you can get in and play that at religion with this silly, empty-headed worship. I love the Lord. You think, I, you think I'm bold, amen? I'm not pleased, God said. And the God of angel armies is not pleased. I don't want any more of this so-called worship. I don't want any more of this so-called worship, God says. How many of you know that this altar is pretty important to God? Not just this altar. As long as I'm senior pastor, this altar will be open. It will be guarded. We will give people an opportunity to come here and be transformed at this altar. 
Because my preaching isn't my, my enticing words and my charisma and, and anything that I could offer you and my Bible knowledge isn't going to transform you. But when I take God's word and put it into my spirit through prayer, through seeking God and getting a word from the mountain from him and out it comes out of my mouth, it will transform you. When it comes out through prayer and praise and worship on Sunday mornings, not just a sound service, but actual heartfelt anointed worship coming from anointed people who love God, it will transform Form our hearts, melt the sinner's heart, convict the sinner, change the saint, grow us from glory to glory. Yes, hallelujah. Come on and put your hands together and magnify the Lord. He's worthy to be praised. Yes. So this morning, we repent. And I may be preaching to the choir, but that's why these little things are up here right now. If you're here this morning or you're watching by TV or you're watching by the internet and this message has hit you, this message has pricked you, then I'm glad it has because God's still working on you. We need to give the Lord the highest praise. Hallelujah. We need to lift Him up. We need to bless Him. We need to worship Him. We need to consecrate our minds that is so it's pleasing to Him. We need to consecrate our lifestyle so it's pleasing to Him. We need to consecrate our life and our hearts so it's pleasing to Him. But pastor, aren't we saved by grace? Yes, we are. But if you really love somebody, you'll obey them. You'll listen to them. You'll honor them. You'll go the extra mile to do what it takes to not dishonor them. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, say this with me. Heavenly Father, I repent right now. I lay me down. I lay me down. And I repent right now. And I ask you to forgive me of in your own words, my shoddy worship, my shoddy prayer life. I know it's disgusting to you. It's dishonoring to you. And I repent and I make a vow now to do better with a heart ablaze and a heart on fire. I will worship you. I will praise you. I will bring everything low that is not of you and exalt only you. If you believe that this morning, say amen. amen. Say amen. I want to bless you with this before. Mark 
die 